Well, good morning to you this morning. Good morning. Hey, good to see you today. And, uh, looking forward to uh, worship together with you. I got uh, some announcements to share, and then uh, we'll get into our, our prayer list today. I do have a little uh, thank you uh, from uh, Sparter uh, for uh, feeding the football team on Thursday night. I'll leave this in the uh, back back there so that you can see it. Just a little thank you note uh, for that. And uh, do want to just uh, uh, say to you that uh, you ought to be really proud of the way our folks took care of, of, of the team on Thursday night. They, they went all out, I'm telling you. And I wish you'd just help me to give them a little thanks, give them a little hand right there. Uh, we had a good night and uh, uh, gave them some different things and talked to them about the Lord's Prayer. They quite, prayer gets quoted a lot at football events and uh, we... We put a little different spin to it, and, and uh, uh, so I hope it was a blessing to, uh, uh, to all of them that were there, had a good, good group in attendance, and, and everything went well. So thankful uh, that we were able uh, to do that Thursday night. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, by way of announcements, the Conecuh uh, County Christian Support Group uh, has its uh, meeting this Thursday at Bowers uh, at 6 p.m., and uh, so uh, any interested in that? Uh, Brother Joe, I know, is actively involved in that. We appreciate uh, that, that group and their help uh, that they give. Uh, in, the, in the bulletin, you notice Operation Christmas Child. It's that time of the year. Preparations are made for that. And uh, shoe boxes are in the back back there. You can pick those up. And information there in the, in the bulletin about it uh, for postage and all of that, it's all right there in the bulletin. November the 13th through the 20th is the collection time for... Uh, the uh, shoe boxes, so uh, those are all the uh, craft class. Uh, next meeting is November the 1st from 10 until 1, so uh, that's there for you. And a sign up in the back, uh, Brotherhood Breakfast, November the 5th, uh, 7 uh, a.m. And then November the 19th, uh, a, a church fellowship uh, starting at 4 p.m. and more details uh, about that coming. So. Uh, those are just some things you can just mark on your calendar and be uh, ready to, uh, to participate with us in, in those uh, different events. Uh, I want to share with you our, our prayer list uh, today. There, there are some names that I want to share that, that uh, we want to add to the list, and then I'll go down uh, our prayer list before we have our scripture reading and pray. Uh, Daryl Levi, uh, one of Luther's friends, want to add to the prayer list uh, this morning. Of course, Dr. Uh, Mike Cartwright, we've been praying for him. want to continue to uh, remember him in prayer. Uh, Dalton Campbell added a prayer list. He's got some surgery coming up on uh, the 30th, so I want to especially uh, remember Dalton. And uh, Robbie Lyles uh, also added to the list uh, today. Uh, as I go down the list, uh, Felix uh, Andrews, uh, Ann uh, Arrington, uh, Rhonda Baggett, uh, Dwight uh, Bennett, uh, Mr. Hireman, Ms. Jimmy Beasley, uh, Kim uh, Brown, Max Bush, Walter Carrier, Wayne Carrier, Justin Chandler, uh, Paula Cobb, Mabry Cook, Kay Evans, Patricia Grigger, uh, Evan L. Hawford, Bad House, Berlin Finley, John Andrews, uh, Pete Wolf, Cheryl Johnston, Mike Luther, Kayla Higdon, uh, Mary Johnson, Danny McLeod, uh, Zach Williams, uh, Cecilia McCullough, uh, Steve Moon, Ruby Philippi, uh, Jeanette Kilgore, uh, Jan uh, Jenny Sapp, uh, Jimmy Cook, uh, Jackie Skipper, Becky Smith, Danny Coven, Janet Stringer, Verley Stuckey, Laura Salter, Jason Morris, uh, Jerry and Lena Warren, Fred uh, McIntyre, uh, Bessie Watts, Tony Weaver, uh, Dustin Crawford, uh, Janice Vickery, uh, Versi Higdon, Larry Oswald, uh, and we can also, Erin uh, Fuller can, can take her name off. I talked with her brother this week, and she is at home and doing well, so we're grateful that, that she's doing much better. Mary Brown, uh, Mary is at home, uh, just continuing to need our prayers week from that stay in the hospital. Uh, Beth uh, Lee, Brenda Wilson, uh, Cora Oswald, uh, Jimmy and Janice uh, Booker, uh, Francis Shadburn, Jeff Baggett, Kevin Reeves, uh, Melissa Robinson, Jesse Hagburn, Gail Armstrong, Patricia McCullough, 
uh, Margaret Thompson, Pat Johnston, Carolyn Leonard, Dan Spikes, uh, Amy uh, Anderson, uh, Maddie Stanton, Ralph Deason, Mr. and Ms. Bartlett, and Lorenzo Calvin, and uh, Danny Eckerman, and Frank Williams. Those are, those are names that are on our prayer list along with those that have uh, been added. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Philippians this morning, the third chapter, and I want to read these verses 12 through 16. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 16. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may apprehend that for which Christ Jesus has also apprehended me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are perfect have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Would you bow together with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I do come to you today and just thank you so much for this day, the beauty, uh, beauty of this day, your creation that already we've had the privilege of enjoying. And Lord, we're gathered together today as a family of faith, gathered in your name, gathered for your cause, to honor and glorify you, to encourage each other in our walk and relationship with you. And Lord, I just pray today that the Holy Spirit of God would anoint this place, that the Holy Spirit of God would guide this service and lead us in all that we do here today. I pray not only for our worship time this morning, but for our Sunday school that follows afterwards. I pray for our Sunday school teachers and for your favor and guidance to be upon them and over them as they open up your word and teach it to the people of God. And Lord, I do come today to pray for these many that are on our prayer list. Names that have been here, names that have been added today. Lord, with each one of them, there are specific needs that each has. Lord, the miraculous thing is that you're the God who can be everywhere and who is able and capable to meet the needs of your people. In fact, Lord, in your word, you have instructed us over and over again to come, to ask, to seek, and to knock. Lord, today, that's what we're doing. We come today on behalf of other people who are not with us, who are suffering, who are going through various physical challenges. And Lord, we pray today that your favor, your love, and your comfort would be upon them. I pray that, Father, today they would feel a sense of your Spirit at work in their lives and that they would be encouraged by knowing that not only are you for them, but that there are other people who are lifting them up in prayer as well. God, again, thank you for the privilege of being saved. Thank you, Lord, that you've forgiven us of our sins. Thank you that you've put us in a family of faith called Olive Branch. And now, Lord, I pray for your blessings on this worship time today. In Jesus' name I do pray it. Amen. Well, if you would, open your Bibles today to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians the third chapter, and uh, we're going to be studying together today these verses 12 through 16. As we uh, continue studying uh, through uh, these verses of Scripture in the book of Philippians, I want to speak today on this subject, running the race, running the race. Paul is is a beautiful teacher and a wonderful preacher. And the reason I say that is because he uses so many pictures or illustrations to help us in understanding the Christian life and what it is all about. In fact, in this third chapter, 
Paul gives us three wonderful pictures of what being a Christian or a child of God is all about. He's already given us one. Back in uh, the eighth verse of this third chapter, he says, I count all things lost. And the word count there is an interesting word. It literally is a, a banker's term or a bookkeeping term. And Paul there is weighing out the options, he says. He's uh, putting things over in the credit column and in the debit column. And what he's saying is, is that knowing Jesus as personal Savior outweighs anything you could ever have in your life. And then he comes down to the verses we're going to study today, these verses 12 through 16, and Paul gives us the picture of the Christian life as, as a runner. It's like running a race. And we're going to talk about that in, in, throughout the message this morning. Next Sunday, when we look at those verses 17 through 21, Paul pictures the Christian life as an alien. We're just a stranger in this world. And we're going to talk about that next Sunday. The message will be called Heaven on My Mind. You see, I think we ought to live on earth and our feet are resting on this old earth and this is where we live. But ladies and gentlemen, we ought to keep heaven on our mind. That's what keeps us going straight in a crooked world. And so he gives us three beautiful pictures of the Christian life. I want to focus on that middle picture for a little while this morning. I want to focus on the Christian life as a race. And Paul pictures it like running a race. He pictures it as being a runner in the race. He gives us all kinds of pictures of the Christian life in the Bible. Sometimes uh, Paul will, will refer to the Christian life being like a wrestling match. Over in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, he says there, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and he pictures the Christian life there as a wrestling match. And then sometimes he pictures it like a, like a boxing contest. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 26, Paul says, I, I run, but not with uncertainty. He said, I fight, but not as one beating the air. In other words, I, I, I'm not just practicing. I'm in a real match. I'm in a real fight. And we know that we are in a fight, don't we, spiritually, and that we do have an enemy. But he also reminds us that this Christian life is like running a race. It's like a runner in a race. Now, I, I like football, and I married a, 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 a wife that likes football. I'm glad she does. We're compatible on Saturdays when we're watching football. And I like to watch those linebackers. I like to watch them come crashing in with unbelievable speed. And some of the speed of those guys is really amazing. Those, those, that 40-yard dash in 4.4 seconds, I mean, that's flying in to make the tackle. But you see, the Christian life is not a sprint. It's not a 40-yard dash. It's not really even a mile run. It is a long-distance marathon, and we are in it for the long haul. And ladies and gentlemen, Paul wants us to understand in these verses today that it's not over until it comes to the very last breath, and we hit the finish line. It's not over until then. And he's going to give us some tremendous encouragement this morning about how to run the life of the race that way. Now, the, the thought that I saw that God gave me this week as I was studying these verses is this. Finishing the Christian life strong is the goal. Finishing the Christian life strong is the goal. You see, one thing about the Christian life different from a regular race, uh, Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. He said, he said, in a regular race, all run. But he said, only one gets the prize. Only one receives the award. Well, the difference in a, in a, in a marathon race that, that's run today and the Christian race is that if you finish, ladies and gentlemen, you hit the tape and you get the prize. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. How that happens. See, what Paul is interested in in these verses this morning and what he encourages us about is the importance of making progress in your Christian life. Now I hope you're making progress this morning. I hope you are maturing. 
You know, one of the things I've always enjoyed doing for the last 12 years is being the chaplain of the Greenville High School football team. We've had up years and down years. But you know, one of the things I always enjoy seeing every year is a team improve. I, I enjoy seeing that. I watch, and you can watch it. Hey, some years it doesn't happen. Some years they don't click for whatever reason. They don't come together as a team. They don't play as a team. Egos can get in the way. And you can have a super talented athlete that thinks the whole thing's built around him and you don't have teamwork. But what I like to see is that team just improve from week to week. They're getting better. They're getting stronger. But guess what? Nothing encourages me more than to see that in the lives of people who are living for the Lord Jesus. Just see people improving, see them in growing in their relationship with God, and see them just getting more and more mature. Now Paul uses an interesting word in these verses to describe this progress of the Christian life. He uses an interesting word. The word he uses is the word perfect. He uses that word several times in these verses of Scripture that I, that I read for you. Verse number 12, he says, Not that I've already attained, or am already perfect. You see that? And then in verse 13, he said, Brother, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forth unto the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God. Verse uh, 15, he says, Therefore, let us as many as are perfect have this mind, and if anything less, you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you. He uses that word perfect. Well, what's he mean? Does he mean sinlessly perfection? No, I don't think that's what he's talking about. This word is often used to describe maturity or progressing along. I have six wonderful grandchildren, and two of them are just special granddaughters. Now, I love my grandboys now, but they're different. And, and, and I love those grandchildren. I got a little eight-year-old granddaughter and a little five-year-old. And, and let me tell you, my little eight-year-old, she is a perfect eight-year-old. And my little five-year-old, she is a perfect five-year-old. Now what do I mean by that? Do I mean that they're just perfectly grown, that they don't have any more growing to do, no more maturing, that they're fully adult young ladies? That isn't what I mean. What I mean when I use that word is that for an eight-year-old, she's exactly right there where she ought to be. She's just right there maturing where she ought to be. And from a five-year-old, she is just exactly perfect five-year-old. She's just right there where she ought to be in maturity and, and coming along as a five-year-old. And that's what Paul is saying when he uses this word. Is, is when Because he, he, he says in verse 12, I, I'm, I'm not where I ought to be. You see that He's, in verse 12? Not that I've already attained or already perfect. See, I, I haven't fully matured. Then down in, in, in verse 15, uh, he, he goes on to say, Therefore, let us as many as are perfect, are mature. In other words, he's saying, For this particular place, I'm exactly where I need to be. And, and that caused me to ask a question. Are you where you need to be as a Christian? Are you right where you need to be as a child of God in your growth and maturity? So how do, we, how do we progress in the Christian life? How do we mature and grow in the Christian life? And I want you to see three things. He talks about this wonderful race that we're in. And there are three things I want you to see about the race. Here's the first thing in verse 12. I want you to notice, number one, the commencing or the starting of the race. In verse 12, he's talking about the commencing or the starting of the race. Now look at ver the verse again. He says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may apprehend that for which Christ Jesus also apprehended me. He's talking about starting the race. Now let's think about the starting of the race. Now this may seem trite and too simple, but folks, you, you can't run a race until you start a race. You understand what I'm saying? You, you, you've got to first start the race before you can ever run the race. And so Paul begins us right here where, where we ought to begin, and that's with the starting of the race. And there are two things I want you to notice that Paul instructs us about concerning the commencing or the starting of the race. N number one is the apprehending of his life. Now let me explain that word. Uh, he uses that word in verse 12. He says, Not, that, not as I've already attained or were already perfect, 
Uh, you notice? And, and, and then he says, uh, as you read that verse, he says, but a press on that I may apprehend that for which also Christ Jesus apprehended me. See that? Apprehended. What does that word mean? Well, it's an interesting word. The word literally means to lay hold of. In fact, the New King James uses that word. Instead of apprehend, it uses lay hold of. So what Paul is saying is, is that there was a day in my life where something laid hold on me. You know what he's talking about? Salvation. He's talking about his salvation experience. He's talking about the day on the Damascus Road when the Lord Jesus Christ got a hold of his life. Now I want to ask you, has, has God laid hold on you this morning? Are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? See, he's talking about salvation, the apprehending of his life. That's when Paul got in the Christian race. That's when he began to run this race of faith, the apprehending of his life. I, I pray you've been laid hold of by God this morning. I pray you've been saved. Hey, when, when did that happen in your life? Could you go back and say, hey, preacher, I, I, that, that, this is when it happened for me. Hey, maybe it'll happen today for somebody, right? Maybe it'll happen today for somebody. Maybe the day will be the day when God will lay hold by grace on your life and bring you into the fellowship of faith and you'll be saved. The apprehending of His life. But then I want you to notice the second thing and that's the apprehension of His life. He was a little anxious about something. Notice what he says in verse 12. He says in verse 12, Not that I have already attained. See that? Nor am I already perfect. In other words, Paul says, I'm, I'm in the race, but I'm not where I need to be in the race. Can anybody identify with that? You see, hey, there, I don't think there'd be anybody in the house that'd raise their hand and say, I'm everything I ought to be for God. Huh? I know I'm not going to raise my hand. Because I'd be telling the field if I I'm everything I ought to be for God. Oh no no, you know I I, I like the story of the of uh, the little first grader who went to school and he went for a whole week and on Friday when he got home he told his mom I'm not going back next week and 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 she said well what, well why aren't you going back he says because can't teach me anything else I learned it all in a week how about that. Well, I got news for you. There isn't anybody in here that knows all they need to know about the Bible. Can I get an amen on that? There isn't anybody in here that needs to know all they need to know about living the Christian life. And none of us are all that we want to be or should be for God. And so he's, Paul is saying, look, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going along in the life. I'm, I'm running the race. I'm in the race. But I'm not where I want to be in the race. And, and so it's the starting of the race and God working in our lives to progress us along. Now this second thought is so very important. Not only the commencing, the starting of the race. Have you got in the race? Are you in the race? Are you running the race? And how are you doing as you run the race? But the second thing is the continuing of the race. See, once you get in, it's, it, now it's time to run, right? It's time to run the race. It's time to live the life, the Christian life. And in the, this, this next verse, verse 13, Paul gives us three tremendous truths of how to run this Christian race of life. These are so very important. They're so practical and they're so important. If you want to be an all-American Christian, now the sad thing is, is that a lot of Christians don't want to be all-Americans. That's the sad thing. It is. I tell you what, you know, you look at some of these athletes, man, they're pushing, they're pushing them weights and, and, and their, their body is all toned up and they're ready to play. And boy, when you come to the church, we get, we're a little flabby spiritually in the church. You know, spiritually so. Our muscles aren't as toned up as they ought to be. Well, here are three tips on how to excel and exceed as a child of God and how to be a spiritual All-American for the Lord. And, and he gives us three of them. I want you to see them. Three phrases and three thoughts. Here's the first thing. If you're going to be an All-American for God, if you're going to progress in the Christian life, there must be, first of all, a concentration on the present. See, you and I as believers face two dangers. We face the danger of the past and the danger of the present. Now let me explain it. We face the danger of the past because if we aren't careful, we'll live in the past. But, but we also face the danger of the present because if we aren't careful, 
will rest in the present. You know, my dad always said, boy, you can't rest on your laurels. I, I never have looked that word up. I believe I'll go see what it means. But I understood what he meant is that you ain't going to sit on the stump over there when we got stuff to do. You ain't going to just rest in the present when we got things to accomplish. Well, God is warning us that the past can be a danger for us and the present can too. And that's why Paul says there needs to be a concentration on the present. And notice what he says in verse 13. He says, this one thing I do. You see that? This one thing. That's concentration, isn't it? He isn't saying two things or three things. You know, somebody said the reason Christians aren't better Christians than they are is they don't say this one thing I do. They say these 40 things I dabble in. Well, Paul is concentrated. He is concentrated. This one thing. You know, a, a drill is a powerful thing. And you know why it's so powerful? Because all the power is concentrated on one point on the bit. See, concentration. You know, they had, a, they had a, a play in football years ago called the flying wedge. And you know, they, they, they made it illegal. They made it illegal. You know why? Because it was causing injuries. Because... Man, you just, you just had the runner blocked up in a wedge. And it became so powerful as it moved down the field, almost unstoppable. There is power and concentration. In fact, I was studying this week, and I got to going back looking at what the Bible has to say about one thing. Wow. The whole many times in the Bible, our Bible talks about one thing. Uh, Psalm 27 and verse 4. The psalmist said, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The psalmist said, there's one thing I'm looking at. Man, I'm looking forward to going to church. I'm looking forward to getting in the house of God. One thing the psalmist said, I'm searching for. And do you remember John chapter 9, verse 25? You remember that passage of Scripture where the, where the guy was blind and, and Jesus healed him? And they were saying that, you know, Jesus was a sinner. And, and uh, they came to the blind man and asked him what he thought about it. I love his answer. He said, whether he be a sinner or not, I don't know. But he said, this one thing I know. Once I was blind, but now I see. One thing, you see. And do you remember when Jesus was talking to that rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21? And he was talking to him, and Jesus said to him, He said, One thing thou lackest. You just lack one thing. But oh, he missed the big thing because he was missing God. He was missing Jesus in his life, and he missed out on the big thing. And then you remember in that same chapter, Mark 10, down verse 42, Jesus is in the home of Martha and Mary. Remember that? And Martha's cooking, and the pans are rattling, and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, and she's frustrated because Mary isn't doing anything. You know what Jesus said to her? He said, she, he, he said Martha, Martha, uh, one thing. You're missing one thing. That's fellowship with me. The Bible talks about one thing so many times. So important to be concentrated in the present on our relationship with the Lord. But not only is there a concentration on the present. Watch this second one. Number two, if you're going to run this race faithfully, be an All-American for the Lord, not only does there need to be a concentration on the present, but a cancellation of the past. Listen to what he said. Forgetting those things which are behind. You see it? Forget it. Now what does he mean? Does he mean that, that, that we can just forget? That, that we need to have amnesia we don't remember it anymore? No, that isn't what he's talking about. If, if I understand any, correctly... They say, the researchers say, we don't forget anything. Right set of circumstances and jog your memory. You'll remember. You know, I was, I, I was working with a tool in, in, in the, my little shop the other day. And when I saw it, I hadn't used it in a long time. Been a long time. And I was reflecting on my, how to go about it. But it was then that I remembered that my daddy had showed me. Well, now he's been gone for a while. But you see what memory did? The tool brought the memory back to my mind. So, so we don't really forget. So what, what's Paul talking about? Well, what he's saying is, is that we don't need to allow what happened in the past 
to keep us from moving forward in the present. See what I'm saying? And, and did you know a lot, of, a lot of Christians are stuck in the past and they can't move forward in the present? Winston Churchill said it really tremendously. When he said, if the present quarrels with the past, there'll be no future. Wow, what a statement. If the present quarrels with the past, then there'll be no future. Because you're going to be stuck in the past while you're walking in the present. And so Paul says, if we're going to keep on going forward in the Christian life, hey, we're going to have to cancel out some things of the past. You say, well, what do you think needs to be canceled? I, I tell you what I believe Paul had to cancel in his life. And I think we have to do the same thing. One, I think we have to cancel out past grief or, or guilt. Paul had to. You don't, you don't think he had dealt with any guilt? Hmm? Murdering people? Come on now. Persecuting the church? Locking folks up? Dividing families? Being responsible for the one who probably took, had lives uh, snuffed out? You, you don't think he had to deal with some of that? But you see, it was the grace of God that helped him with the past and allowed him to realize that God had forgiven him. And hey, sometimes Christians can't move forward in the present. They don't serve in the present. They don't serve because they're dealing with the past and they can't get over something that happened in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, God has the grace to forgive if you'll just confess it to Him and move forward. So, so past guilt. i tell you something else. Past grief. Paul had been hurt. You know, he, he'd been beaten, left for dead. They just walked out and hoped he'd going to die. And look at all the things that happened to him. Shipwrecked, all kinds of things. You know, he could have held on to those things, but, but he got over them. Past grievances. You know, sometimes we can't go forward because somebody hurt our feelings. And so we can't get over that. And so, hey, I'm telling you, there are people not serving in church today because they got the feelings hurt, and so they just step back and they're just not doing anything. Look, don't let somebody else rob you out of serving God. If God called you to serve, you get in there and you serve. You know, I love the story of, of, of General uh, Robert E. Lee. When the Civil War ended, he was up in Virginia visiting with a lady. And in the course of the visit, she carried him out in the yard. And she showed him one of those beautiful oak trees that were on their property. And she said, I want you to just look at that. What do you think about that? And yes, when the, when the, when the northern troops had come through, they had defaced that tree. They had, they, had, they had carved their initials into that tree and scarred it up. And it was scarred for life. And she is bitter about it. And she looked at General Lee and she said to him, now what do you think I ought to do with that tree? He said, ma'am, you need to cut it down and move on. And ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we just have to cut some trees down and move on. Amen? If, we, if we're going to go forward in the Christian life, not only a concentration on the present, but a cancellation of the past. And then, number three, a contemplation of the prize. No, no, notice what he says as he closes out this 13th verse. He says, not, not only one thing I do, but he says, forgetting those things which are behind. And then watch the word, reaching forth to those things which are ahead. Reaching. I, I like that word, reaching. Man, that's, that's, that's out there for all you can get. You know, if I'm reaching my hand, it can't go any further because I, I got it reached out. And the picture here is of an athlete running the race. And I mean, they're stretched out in the run. Can't you see them? The heart is pounding in their chest. Their lungs are, 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 are just inhaling gulps of oxygen. They're, 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 they're in an all-out press to finish the race, to hit the tape at the very end and to come to the finish line. And Paul says that, that's how we need to be. There needs to be a contemplation of, of, of the goal. Hey folks, I don't know about you, I want to finish strong. I do. I want to finish strong. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't. I don't have an idea about how that's going to look like. Because, you know, the older you get, the kind of slower, slower things get. But look, I, I, I want to be like old Caleb. He was 85 years old, wasn't he? And, and, and the, he's just as strong, it said. Now, 
I, I think maybe probably more inward, but he had some physical strength with him as well. But I want to finish strong. I want to finish faithful for God. Amen? That's what I want to do. And that's what Paul is encouraging us in these verses to do. The, the continuing of the race, the commencing of the race, and then finally, there is the completing of the race. And in these verses 15, 16, and 17, he comes down to the completing of the race. We, we, we're running the race and we're running to the finish line. Our eyes are fixed. We are contemplating where we're headed. We are canceling out the past. We are concentrated on the present daily, daily, day by day, living for the Lord. And eventually, one of these days, we're going to complete the race, folks. Boy, what, a, what an encouragement these last verses are. There, there, there are three things I want you to see. One, there's the mark to reach. Do you see it? The mark to reach. You notice what he says in verse 14? He says in verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize. There's a mark to reach. Paul's saying, I, I, I got my eyes on the finish line. There's a mark to reach. Do you have your eyes on the finish line this morning? Hey folks, there's a mark to reach. Not only is there a mark to reach, and, and this isn't a point, this is just a thought. There, there's a master to see one of these days. You know, I like that Hebrews 12 too. It says, looking unto Jesus, let's do it, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, now think about what that's saying. Jesus is the author. That means He's right there at the start when we get in the race. But He's also what? He's the finisher which means He's going to be right at the end when we hit the tape and come to the end of the race. You see it? He's there at the beginning. He's there at the end. And the Bible says He'll never leave us or forsake us, which means I got Him all in between until I do come to the final part of the journey. But what a, what a beautiful picture that is. There's a, there's a mark right here to reach. And, and, and I want to... I want to I want to hit the tape. I want to be running faithful and strong for Jesus when the end comes for me in my life. So there's, there's a mark to reach, but watch this. There's a medal to receive. A medal to receive. Notice what he says in verse 14. He says, I press on in that verse toward the goal of the prize of the high or upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's a beautiful picture right there. Here's what happened in the Olympic Games in Bible days. When a runner would hit the tape first, he had won the race. Here's what would happen. He would be carried to a special place and he would await the official call. In other words, they were, they were waiting for the, for the official call from the emperor himself. And the emperor would have a high box up in the stadium. And that's where he watched the race. It's also where he awarded the person who had won the race. So he's down here running the race. He gets the upward call. He gets the high call. See, Paul, Paul understood those events. And, and he gets the call from the emperor to come up. And he comes up to the emperor's box. And in the emperor's box, he is awarded all the glory of the race. There was, it was big in those days. He, he, he had 500 drachma coins were given to him and, and, and various uh, uh, benefits he would receive throughout the course of the year because he had won the race. He'd get to come to all the other events free. And, and there were benefits for his family because he had won the race and he had been called up to the emperor's box. Oh, do you see, ladies and gentlemen, how it's going to be one of these days? We're down here just running the race. We're just faithfully running for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in the race. We're running the race. And one of these days, we're going to come to the end of the race. And when we do, we're going to get the call. And it's an upward call. And brother, it isn't going, it isn't going to be the emperor's box. It's going to be the king of kings box that we're going to be called to. And we're going to be... Paul, Paul put it this way. He said, I fought a good fight. And he said, you know, I finished the race and I kept the faith. And then listen to what he said in, in 2 uh, Timothy 4 and verse 8. He said, henceforth there is laid, watch what it said, where? Laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day. And not to me only, 
but unto all those who love His appear. And i got news for you. There's not only an upward call for Paul, there's an upward call for you and an upward call for me one of these days if we'll faithfully run the race. You know, I've been to Rome. I've seen that prison where eventually they carried Paul and put him in. I've walked across the street where they say, I don't know if it's where it was or not, the old guillotine was, where eventually they carried Paul out of that Mamertine prison and carried him across the street over there and strapped him down, and he lost his life. You know, I was thinking about that this week. They carried old Paul out of that prison, carried him over there, put him in the guillotine. The blade fell, and his life was lost. Perhaps somebody said, poor old Paul, he bit the dust today. Oh, no, no. He hit the tape, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't bite the dust. He hit the tape. And you know, one of these days, my body ain't going to last forever. My spot's already picked out. I ain't getting morbid about wanting to get there too soon, but it's been picked out. And one of these days when I don't breathe anymore and somebody says, well, that poor preacher, he bit the dust. Don't you believe it for one minute, ladies and gentlemen, I hit the tape. And that's true for every one of us as the people of God. See, there's a medal to receive. And then notice the message to remember. Don't don't miss this. The message to remember. And and he, he gives us that in verses 15 and 16. He says, therefore, let us, as many as are perfect, mature, Maturing, let us have this mind. What mind? This mind of progressing in the Christian life. This mind of growing as a child of God. This mind of seeking to be everything we can for God. And to be all He He said, we need to have that mind. See, that ought to be the mind we got right here in this room. And we ought to encourage each other in that. And He says, if you don't have that mind, then God will, God will talk to you about it. That's my paraphrase, but you notice he says it. And, and, if anything, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you. He'll, he'll, he'll show you. Nevertheless, he says, verse 16, to the degree that we have already attained. In other words, we're already maturing. Let us walk by this same rule. Progressing, moving forward, growing. Hey, we ought to be getting a little better, a little better, a little better each week. Just like a good football team improves. Christians ought to be improving a little bit, a little bit, a little bit alone. That ought to be the mindset. At the bottom of one of those Swiss mountains, there's a little country church. And there is a man buried in the cemetery of that little country church who died trying to climb that mountain. His body, his grave, is in that little church. Now I want you to listen. They have just his name there. The date that he was born and the date that he died. And then listen to what it said. They put an epitaph at the bottom of those dates. And here's what the epitaph says. He died climbing. He died climbing. I want to tell you that's how I want to go out. I want to go out growing. I want to go out climbing for Jesus Christ. We sang it. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. That that ought to be our motto. That ought to be the motto of every Christian and child of God in this room today. That will end growing climbing, progressing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow together with me for prayer? Heavenly Father, I come to you today and first of all, Lord, just thank you for these verses of Scripture. I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of this passage. Lord, it encourages us to keep on growing. It encourages us to keep on going. No matter how difficult the way gets, Lord, we just keep on going. And Father, we can keep on going because you're right here with us. 
encouraging us as we run this race of life. Help us to progress and help us to run it faithfully and help us to finish strong for you. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, we're going to sing our closing hymn, our hymn of invitation. And if you are here today and you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, then boy, let, let today be the day God lays hold of your life. You know, Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 12, he said, lay hold on eternal life. Well, well how do you do that? Well, let me explain it to you this way. God lays hold of us in grace. We lay hold of Him by faith. And I will encourage you today, if you've never by faith trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, do that today. Lay hold of eternal life today by faith. If you know Jesus, then let's go away from here determined with God's help to be faithful followers and to grow and progress and mature in our walk with the Lord. I want you to turn to our hymn of invitation. It's 185. Hymn 185. If you'll turn to that, and then if you'll, as you find it, just stand with me. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation. If there is a public decision or commitment that needs to be made today, I'm here to help you with that. If there's something I can pray with you about, I'm here to help you with that as we sing together this invitation song. I want to thank you for being here today. Just remind you about Sunday school before uh, we dismiss this morning. And I do appreciate you so much being a part of worship with us today. EJ, I'm going to ask you to dismiss us in prayer today, if you would, brother. Yes, sir. Our most gracious and loving Father, oh dear Jesus, what a wonderful message that we needed this morning. Father, to open our eyes and our hearts and may everyone see here today, Father, without you, they are nothing. They're not going anywhere, Father. They're not going to enjoy life in heaven, Father, and walk the streets of gold with you. Dear Jesus, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will touch every heart, open every <coughs> eye, that they may see you, Father, as who you are, our Lord and Savior, who came and died on Calvary's cross to give us life and give it more abundantly. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have given, Father, and all the blessings. And I pray for my sister, Father. She was in a terrible accident yesterday. I pray, dear Jesus, you will bless her and guide her and strengthen her. And may she continue getting better. Well, I pray all this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.